Amen. So guys, please welcome our apostolic leader, Roger, as he ministers this morning. Amen. Thank you. It is really such a joy to be with you this morning. And um, I want to say something about your leaders. Am I standing in the right place? Um, I know there's lighting and there's a video thing happening. So I want to say something about your leaders. I've had the privilege of walking with Timber and Amy for many years now. I'm a better man for you, Timber, in my life. And uh, Timber and Amy are dear friends of Nick and I. But more than that, Tim and Amy and the, the elders and pastors here are outstanding men who have been tried and tested, who have come through good seasons and bad seasons. And if, if you don't know these leaders, I want to commend them to you as outstanding men and women who love and honor and fear God. So if you're new here or if you've only been here for a short while and are these good people, these are outstanding people. And this is an outstanding church. Thank you for that lovely introduction. As I said in the first service, I'm going to send it to my mother-in-law. So, <laughs> let me introduce my family to you. And um, I'm so grateful that my sons and my daughters in love, not daughters-in-law, love God. The two young ladies at the front are my son's wives. It's Amy and Laura. And both my sons married up. They married women slightly older than them, but also just women who have stood with them and helped them become greater men. Um, the one couple have announced very bravely that they're going to have kids, so I'm looking forward to becoming a grandfather, God willing, next year. <laughs> then our two sons, the one in the middle is James. He's serving, not full-time, he's a consultant full-time, but serving and about to be set in as an elder early next year in the the church, the City Bowl Church, Every Nation City Bowl, and just Tim and Amy serve there. The church has prospered and thrived all the way through COVID. And then the young man on the left is my son, Sean, who's a campus minister serving Every Nation Stellenbosch, and he's just a powerful, passionate evangelist, and he wants to go to restricted nations. He wants to go to those nations where it's hard to go. And uh, we've cried a few tears, my wife and I, but we've all signed up to give our lives for Jesus. Amen. Amen. So it's whether it's our lives or our son wants to go with his wife and go to these wild and crazy places, we say yes and amen. And then my mother-in-law hid behind Sean. If you wonder what's that sign, just who's amazing as well. But uh, you, can't, you can't see her. I want to tell you about my wife, Nicola. We've been married this year. It'll be 32 years. And uh, she... She is incredible. She stands with me, helps me, challenges me, loves me, just in so many incredible ways. And I'm much better for her in my life. Nicola lives with a particular mystery. And I want to I minister to you in your place of mystery before we go to the Word. So what is mystery code word for? Mystery is code word for unanswered prayers. Mystery is code word for I don't understand why this happened or this didn't happen. Luke 24, Jesus has risen. It's Resurrection Sunday. And now you find two disciples, they're walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, it's about 12 kilometers, and they're broken. And they, Jesus comes alongside them, but he doesn't reveal himself fully doesn't reveal that it's Jesus. So they're talking to him, and, and Jesus said, what are you talking about? What, he says, are you, they say, are you the only one who didn't hear what's just happened in Jerusalem? And Jesus starts to break open the word to them. And it says that their hearts burned as he did that. They get to Emmaus, and it says Jesus made as if to keep going. He made as if, as if he was going to continue on his journey. And then, then they said, no, Jesus, come. Well, they didn't know it was Jesus. But they said, come, spend the night with us. So it looked like he was going to move in one way. But what he wanted was for them to invite him in. So they invite him in. And he breaks bread with them. And in the breaking of the, of the bread, they realize that it's Jesus. 
and then he disappears. Were you that guy or that girl that played hard to get ever? Anybody ever play hard to get? You played hard to get. Richard, you played hard to get. <laughs> Grace is saying you played hard. Have you ever played hard to get but you wanted to be got? <laughs> okay, you played hard to get. Now, it's not that God plays hard to get that he does. He wants us to invite him in. These mysterious moments, these moments of lack of clarity or not yet answered prayers, they are invitations to press into Jesus. And Proverbs says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, glory of kings to uncover a matter. Glory for you and I as kings and queens to find out what the answer to the mystery is. In John 6, Jesus says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. And a whole lot of people just sign out and leave. And he says to his disciples, do you want to go too? And they say, Lord, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Your mystery might be a, a relationship that's broken. It might be a healing that hasn't yet come. It might be a financial breakthrough that you need. But can we resolve today, as Nicola and I have, Nicola lives with spinal condition the last seven years. She prays for people, they get healed, but she's not yet healed. We are not going to allow our mystery to stop us from loving God, Amen. to stop us from serving Him. I've got, I've got questions in my question box one day God will answer them either on earth or in heaven he'll reveal it but I'm not going to stop doing what I'm called to do because of the mystery I want to pray for you I want to trust that the Holy Spirit ministers to you if you are living with mystery unanswered prayer or pain or healing needed or financial breakthrough won't you just stand I'm standing with you and I want to pray for you so by standing, you're saying, Lord, I've got this mystery, but I bring it to you. Just lift up your arms, lift up your hands. Lord, we bring our mystery before you. And Lord, we, we start with saying, you are good, Lord. We declare you are good. And Lord, we don't understand, but we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop seeking you. We're not going to stop loving you. And Lord, we see this mystery as an invitation to press into you. And so we resolve today to pursue you, to not give up. Lord, to ask and keep asking, to seek and keep seeking, to knock and keep knocking until we get the breakthrough. Father, as we lift up our hands, we pray for grace and for strength and for anointing from on high to persevere, to continue to love you, to serve you, and to do what we're called to do. Sustain us, we pray, Lord God. Sustain us in the pursuit of you until you answer us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I'm going to talk to you about love and honor. We're in the book of Romans. We're going through it chapter by chapter. We're looking at Romans chapter 14, which is about love, agape love, and honor. Honoring your brother and honoring God. And here we go. Romans 14 verse 1. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. But not to quarrel over opinions. Debatable things, some versions say. One person believes he may eat anything, while, uh, while the weak person <coughs> excuse me, eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his master that he stands or fails. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Talking about those people who keep Sabbath and those who don't. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to the God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, 
and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. For we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why, or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For as it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean, he's talking about food, for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So, do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. This word to me is about love. And it's about honor. The last six weeks, I've been meditating on Proverbs chapter 3, where it says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. And it's been a remarkable template, because love and faithfulness is much like love and honor. It's been a remarkable template. I've just said, in my decision making, in what I'm doing, does it come from love and faithfulness? And does it result in love and faithfulness? And if it doesn't, then I'm not going to do it. But my first point, and what is clear in Scripture, is that this is about welcome. <laughs> it says, welcome the brother. I want you to go back in your mind to a time that you were new. And you went into a place where you were feeling awkward. Maybe it was a new job, maybe a new client, maybe new school, make new college, new, new relationships. You came in feeling insecure. You came in feeling awkward. And someone really welcomed you. Can you remember that? Do you remember how good it felt for somebody just to take your hand and properly welcome you? Just ho hold that emotion because we are called to welcome. Think about the opposite. Think about when you arrived at a place and people made it clear to you that you were unwelcome. The rejection, the indifference, the pain that you felt. We are called to welcome one another. It says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. Not to quarrel, for God has welcomed him. The word is proslambano, which means take to oneself or take. Or take as one's companion. Or take by the hand. This is the welcome we're talking about. Or take and receive into your home with the implication of kindness. And to receive or grant access to your heart. We are called to take people who are different to us. Who have got different opinions, different perspectives. In the first service, Sandili didn't have his jacket on and he was wearing just red t-shirt and, and a red hat and, and here I'm in blue and I thought I wonder if people think I'm DA and I wonder if they think he's I wonder if they think he's EFF 
The point is you should be receiving people who are different to you. This is the very point of what he's saying. Not to argue with them. 1 Corinthians 8 says this, 8 verse 1. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I've been like this as a Christian in seasons where I've got, I've got a viewpoint on everything. And I'm quick to argue, but it's fruitless. We're not called to be full of, of knowledge as much as we are called, first and foremost, to be full of love. Have knowledge, have wisdom, yes, but first and foremost, have love. There's life and death, brothers and sisters, in the power of the tongue. Will you, lose, will you use your tongue to welcome as opposed to argue and, and be divisive? Years ago, we were running a connect group and we invited this couple to come for supper before connect group. And uh, this guy was devastated because a particular president, U.S. presidential election had just happened and he was just broken that this person had uh, won the presidential election. And uh, then we finished supper, then the rest of the connect group arrived. And I said, any testimonies? So one guy goes, I just want to thank God that so-and-so has just won the presidential election. <laughs> so the one is grieving, and the other one is celebrating. So God just gives me wisdom. I, I just said this, God bless America. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring division. I wasn't going to bring division about something like that. You know, one of the primary ways that churches grow is through welcome. Can we commit, as every nation Sunning Hill, to make this a place of welcome? Amen. Where people of every tribe and tongue, color, creed, political per persuasion, economic consideration is welcome. Paul goes on to say, verse 2, one person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Now the context was that if you wanted to eat meat, you would go to the marketplace and usually the meat that was there had been a sacrifice to an idol. And then what was not burnt, just a little bit was burnt, would be then sold at the marketplace and could sustain the temples. So there were people who were saying, we are spiritual and we are not going to eat, eat meat sacrificed to idols. And then there were others who were saying, we are free in Jesus. You know, everything is to be received with thanksgiving and, and everything's clean. We're not sure who first said this, but I love it. He said, in essentials, talking about as Christians, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, let there be liberty. But in all things, let there be charity. And by charity, we mean love. The spiritual were saying, we're not going to eat this. And the free were saying, we're not going to be bound. Now, I don't want you to lift up your hands, because maybe this example, maybe this doesn't relate to you. But okay, don't, don't tell me where you are. Some of you were pro-vax when we had COVID. And some of you were vax-free or anti-vax. Okay, so during the season, we faced within every nation just these, this multiplicity of viewpoints. And people were starting to move towards separating. And so we put out a video and said this, we will not separate over vaccination. We will not separate. There are far more important things at stake the kingdom of god and eternity and preaching the gospel and bringing the gospel to people that they encounter god you know historically the church has veered into expressing viewpoints on things that scripture is not clear on how many of you remember when to go to church you had to as men wear jackets and ties how many of you remember or went to a church where women had to wear headdresses, had to wear a hat? Or sometimes churches, churches today where women have to wear skirts or dresses. They're saying things that aren't clear in Scripture. And I'm saying to you, let's not divide on things that the Word of God is not clear on. There's a beautiful word, magnanimity. 
It's from two words. Magnus, not the ice cream. Okay. <laughs> Magnus means great. Okay, that's what the word means. It is a great ice cream. But Magnus and animus. Animus means spirit. So magnanimity means to be great spirited. Can we be great spirited towards one another? That we don't separate on whether somebody's a vegan or not, or is a vaxxer or not. That we don't despise people who have got different views than us, that we're not judging them. I love this. It says, it is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So there's a degree to which we're saying, on these non-essentials, on these things that aren't clear in Scripture, God's got them, and God will make it clear for them. God will make it clear. Let's go to the principle of honor, and I put up a beautiful picture of timber. Uh, you remember those wanted dead or alive? <laughs> Paul, Paul writes, he says, One esteems one day is better than another, while one esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in the honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. None of us lives to himself. None of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. There are people who are passionate about keeping the Sabbath. There are people who are passionate about keeping the Sabbath, not on the Sunday, which New Testament describes as the Lord's Day because he rose. Some people keep it on the Saturday. Some keep people even keep it from Friday night because the day starts in the Hebrew calendar in the evening. And some people say, every day is unto the Lord. Every day I'm living for him. Some people celebrate Christmas. Some people say, no, no, it's a pagan festival that's been taken over. Can we not separate on these things? Is what Paul is saying. Can we live for him? And can we honor him? And can that be the focus of our lives? And instead of us being compliance officers over everybody else. Enforcement officers. Now listen, I'm, I have to fly this afternoon. We've got a campus event down in Durban. I'm not going to stay long. I've got to get through the traffic and get through the 94.7. But I'm grateful that there's compliance officers on airplanes, right? <laughs> I'm grateful that those planes are right. But there's some things that we're not meant to be compliance or enforcement officers over one another. You know the Ten Commandments, and then there were the 613 commandments that Moses gave, 613. And then the Jewish leaders said, well, they're not clear enough, so let's create even more clarity. So they wrote what is called the Talmud, okay, which is 2,711 pages. And if you want to get a handle on it, it's the, called the Dof Yomi cycle. It takes seven years and five months to go through that. And it's layer upon layer. So there's one verse that says, don't cook a calf in its mother's milk. And from that, they have extracted that you should have two different kitchens, one for milk and one for meat. And without sounding judgmental, it's a bit like EU, United, the European Union bureaucracy, where they have got thousands of pages written about how to make cheese. Okay? It's more and more enforcement. You know, I, I had a bunch of guys... Um, I, I run in the secular running crew and I'm seeing great, great advance of the kingdom of God. I've got about nine guys that stay afterwards, after the run. But I was asked by these bunch of Christians uh, who, I was worried about them because I felt like they weren't being radical enough. I was asked by a bunch of these guys to come running with them one morning. So I went running with them and they, they said this to me. Again, it's politics and I'm deliberately not using South African politics. They said, uh, so, Roger, we want to know what you think about Donald Trump just being elected as president of America. <laughs> 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 I 
So I said this. I said, and I, I felt the Spirit give me wisdom. I said, you know, I'm, I'm honored that, that my opinion is important to you. Okay, thank you that you, you give me that, that honor. But you know what I wish you'd do? I wish you'd ask me instead how you can be better men. I wish you'd ask me how you can live for Jesus, how you can be better husbands, how you can serve God better. Because we are called to live for His honor and for His glory. If I'd gone down the track of giving them my opinion, we would have either agreed or disagreed, and we would have come away with almost like a pharisaical judgment that we've, we've decided that's right or wrong or whatever, and now we feel good about ourselves. But we haven't lived for the honor of God. Yeah. Ourselves. And it's easy to stand on the sidelines and critique and criticize and point fingers at others as opposed to you and I. If we eat, we eat for the glory of God. If we don't eat, we do it for the glory of God. We do it in faith and we do it with a full heart. Can we make His honor, His glory, our great goal? Who knows what YOLO stands for? You only live once. It's wrong. I, give, I submit to you, Yale. You actually live for eternity. When we feel like we only live once, we feel like we have to do everything and we have to fulfill our own dreams and our own lives. But the biblical standpoint is we actually live for eternity. And eyes and seen or ear heard or mind conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. And therefore we live now for His honor and for His glory. And Matthew 6, 19, we store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Because we live for eternity. And, and this is just the introduction. This is just the audition. We are called now on earth, whether we eat or drink or don't, to live for His glory. Amen. To live for His honor. The Every Nation mission statement says we exist to honor God by establishing Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation. I love that our mission statement is a global family. It says, we exist for his honor. We're not here for our own honor, for our own name, for our own glory. We exist to honor God. Now Paul goes on to say, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Why do you despise your brother? Because all of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of God. And each of us will give an account. On that final day, every knee will bow. Every tongue confess. It's not because they have now received Jesus as their Savior, but they'll stand before the glory and the power and the awesomeness. And for many, it'll be terrifying. Revelation 20 says this. The books are recorded in the books. Every single deed that you and I have committed on earth. How do you feel about that? Sure. Aish. Aina. <laughs> Every single thing that we've ever done has been recorded. But thank God there's another book. Yeah. Revelations 13. Book of life. Where our names are written. Those of us have put our heart and our faith in Jesus. And then when everything's read out, Jesus stands up as our advocate. And the charges are dropped because he's paid the full price. But nevertheless... The question is, will you live your life well? Will you run in your lane? In, in the running crew, um, I get faster, I get stronger. I'm 59 now. And then I start running with the 30-year-olds. And then I keep up with them for a while. And then I injure myself. So I rotate injuries. You know, it's like either it's my ankle or it's my, my knee or it's my hamstring. And then I complain, compray. It's a combination of praying and complaining, you know, simultaneously. And I'm like, God, why am I injured? And then God says this to me, run in your lane. Stop trying to run with the 30-year-olds. Be what you are. Be the 59-year-olds. And, and I realize it's for all of us in life. Are we running in our lane? Are we doing what we call to do? Or am I worried about how other people are running? Am I comparing myself to others? 
and trying to be ahead of them or judge them or whatever it might be. God has spoken to me, run in your lane, not just physically, but run in my lane in life. Can we be less bothered about what other people do and more concerned about the path, the track that God has given to each of us to do? Just hold that in your, in your heart for a moment and let God speak to you. There's a blessing, there's a joy in you being who you call to be before God. And not being caught up in being upset about what other people aren't doing, should be doing. Can we focus on ourselves first and foremost? Instead of being all judgy about everybody else. He goes on to say, don't put stumbling blocks before each other. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of the brother. Then he says, he's persuaded that nothing is unclean in itself. But if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. You know, our Western mindset that has come into, come into all of our minds is that Everything is about me as an individual. But the Hebrew mindset was one of the collective. And I submit to you that the biblical mindset is one of the collective. Our God himself is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God dealt with Israel as a collective. And God wants us to see ourselves from a collective point of view. That if our brother is hurting, we all hurt. We all draw a circle around our lives. The only question is, how big is that circle? I pray that you include your family, and I pray you include your church. If you're a visitor here, so glad to have you. If you're the perpetual visitor that never commits to anything, I urge you to commit and to start to carry your brothers and sisters and start to see things from a collectivist mindset. Who's the most important person on earth? I believe it's the bride of Christ, which we are part of. There are many scriptures which we claim for ourselves, like the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We claim that for ourselves, but the context is it's for us as a collective. We are meant to live out our faith in community. We're meant to therefore consider how we live our lives, what it does to our brothers and sisters, that we don't cause our freedom to be a stumbling block for others. When my sons were growing up, we said this to them, you are free and you're responsible, <laughs> which is really saying you are free, but do not use your freedom to be a stumbling block to others. The kingdom of God, Paul writes here, is not about our consumption, it's not about our fleshly fulfillment, but it's about a far richer life. It's about righteousness, and it's about peace, and it's about joy in the Holy Spirit. If your life is just about money or TV or shopping or how many likes you get on Instagram, you are missing it completely. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, in us walking with Him, in us knowing Him, and Him knowing us. Now, am I saying that everything is up to your own personal preference? Am I saying that there's no absol absolutes? By no means. Let's go to that next slide. There are certain things that are indisputable. Romans 14 verse 1 says, don't argue about disputable things. There are certain things that are indisputable. Scripture reveals it, who God is. Scripture itself says in Timothy, is God breathed. We know, and these things are indisputable, God created us. We know that Jesus is the only sacrifice and the only mediator. We understand what the gospel is. We understand what salvation is. We understand the need for the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it's better that I go. We understand the importance of being in community. Confess your sins one to another that you might be healed. We understand the sacraments of baptism and communion. 
we understand what sanctification is. If we don't yet understand it, next year we're doing a theme of set apart. These things are, are not up for debate. And that's why Paul says, he who is spiritual judges all things. But there are things apart from that that are not clear in Scripture. And that's what I'm talking about. Those things that aren't clear in Scripture, we're not going to divide on. And we're not going to bring conflict. And we're not going to be a stumbling block to our brothers and sisters in. As I start to conclude, Paul writes, he says, Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. You know, I, and I'm sure many of you have, have been grieved by some celebrity pastors who, through their sins and failings with regards to immorality or finances, have actually destroyed the work of God. It's, it's terrible. And unless we move quickly into thinking about that, think about your own life. Do you live your life in such a way that people look at you and go, what is it about you? And you get an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. May our lives and how we live not destroy the work of God. But even more, may how we live our lives, how we express our faith, be such that people say, what is it about you? And we get to say, Jesus. Let me tell you about what my life used to be. If you see goodness, if you see glory, if you see encouragement, if you see a twinkle in my eye, it's not because of me. It's because of Jesus. Can we move away from stumbling people? Can we move away from contentiousness? And can we move towards love and honor? Yes. Loving our brothers and sisters and honoring God in all that we do. Recap. Let's welcome one another. Let's welcome the new people. Let's not argue with people. Let's welcome people. Let's live with the motto of, in the essentials, we live in unity. In the non-essentials, that which Scripture isn't clear on, is freedom. But in everything, there's charity. In everything, is love. Can we honor God by our lives? Can we live with the fear of God that we will stand before the judgment seat of God. Can we make sure we put no stumbling block before our brothers and sisters? Can we focus on the kingdom of God instead of our own flesh? And can we express our faith in such a way that God is glorified and people come to him? Let's pray together. That wasn't a mic drop, that was a water drop. <laughs> Let's pray. Bow our heads. Lord, what a privilege that you have taken us out of darkness, that you have forgiven us, that you have cleansed us. What a joy that you don't hold our sins against us. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the price. Lord, that our sins are washed away and that we have eternal life from now forever. Father, I pray that our hearts and our lives would be transformed. That we would no longer live for ourselves, but we'd live for your honor, and we'd live for those around us. Lord, that people would be drawn to you. I pray that we would not stumble, our brother, our sister, by our freedom, but we would live with care and thoughtfulness and compassion, and Lord, through our lives, people would be drawn to you. People would encounter you. People would find strength and find life in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.